Final item of business is members' business debate on motion 11357 in the name of Graham Day on banning the sales of energy drinks to under 16s. And this debate will be put, sorry, will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Graeme Day to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr Day. Uh, presiding officer, uh, let me begin by thanking those colleagues from across the chamber uh, for supporting my motion and allowing this debate to take place. I think that support reflects the genuine interest uh, there is in halting the sale of energy drinks to under 16s and the recognition of the negative impact upon young people that, that there is of consuming these liquids. Like colleagues, I've been aware for some years now of a desire and a need to restrict the sale of highly caffeinated energy drinks to minors. My own interest goes back to 2015 when the campaign group responsible retailing of energy drinks brought their concerns to Parliament. If memory serves, it was our former colleague Sarah Boyack who facilitated the event here for them. I'd already been hearing anecdotally of the impact consumption was having on secondary school pupils in my constituency of Angus South. While secondary schools in Angus operated in line with 2014 Scottish Government guidance to disallow the sale of energy drinks within their premises, I was hearing from teacher friends of pupils heading off campus during the lunch break, consuming these drinks and returning to disrupt afternoon classes. Offering a perspective on the problem, one teacher told me, Bad enough when you've one 15-year-old boy playing up. Imagine what it's like trying to control and teach a class when you've two or three. So three years on, I'm delighted to see the growing recognition of the problem these drinks pose when consumed by youngsters, an understanding assisted by the Courier newspaper's Can It campaign, and Scotland's major supermarkets voluntarily restricting the sale of energy drinks only to those aged over 16. But just this week, I heard from a head teacher of the significance of the problem remaining in our schools. He noted that the only way to describe how one pupil he'd encountered recently after she'd consumed some of these drinks was that she was like a wild animal. A few months ago, following announcements from uh, ASDA, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, Aldi and Waitrose that they were voluntarily ceasing sales to under-16s, I wrote to the other large supermarkets, urging them to follow that lead. I, I was pleased to receive responses from all of those businesses revealing they would be doing so. Poundland, Boots and W. H. Smith have also embraced this approach. That's a hugely positive step in the right direction and I hope we can all of us tonight welcome it. Supermarkets tend to attract a deal of criticism, often merited it should be said, but when they prove themselves capable of responsible retailing, we ought to give them credit where it's due. However, just as important as the restrictions introduced by our larger stores was the decision of the National Federation of Retail News Agents to encourage their members to follow suit. The Federation's 1,500 independent Scottish re retailers are now strongly encouraged to introduce the voluntary restrictive measures. The voluntary measures that have been adopted by supermarkets and the NFRN should help reduce the negative impacts energy drinks have, uh, have, have and have had within our schools, not to mention the health of youngsters. Because growing public concern on this issue from a health perspective is well-founded. In 2016, the British Medical Journal published a report covering 400 studies into the consumption of energy drinks amongst 11 to 18-year-olds. The BMJ's report found strong links between young people's consumption of energy drinks and a higher risk of symptoms of poor health, such as headaches, stomach aches, hyperactivity and insomnia. Similarly, in 2014, researchers from the World Health Organization created a narrative on the current literature on the health risks of energy drink consumption. Their work agreed that there is, and I quote, a proven negative effect of caffeine on children. Continuing the report stated, and I quote again, there is the potential for a significant public health problem. The WHO researchers agreed that public concern was broadly valid and recommended a restriction of energy drink sales to adolescents. Following a further report published by the European Food Safety Authority in 20. 13 that found 68% of adolescents regularly consume energy drinks with an average intake of seven litres a month. The EU's Health and Food Safety Commissioner at the time made clear that he would consider a move to ban the sale to minors. It was the first time data had been collected at European level to track consumption amongst children and adolescents. And on the back of those findings, Lithuania became the first EU nation 
to ban the sale of energy drinks to minors, with Latvia following soon after, imposing similar, uh, similar measures. However, it needs to be recognised that there have been successful legal challenges mounted elsewhere, in France, for example, when bans have been introduced. Now, the celebrity chef Jamie Oliver is campaigning for such a move UK-wide. He wrote to me a few weeks back, having heard suggestions I might be minded to bring forward a member's bill to that effect in Scotland. Presiding officer, given the momentum behind retailers and other businesses taking voluntary measures, I understand the Odeon Cinema Group and the petrol station ch chain Shell have also now ceased selling energy drinks to, to under-16s. I'm not inclined to do that at this time. We should, I think, take time to consider both the challenges and the possible benefits that legal restrictions on the sale of energy drinks to under 16s could encounter, not to mention the extent to which voluntary action might actually get us where we need to go on this issue. Although, sitting alongside this, all of us should actively engage with other retailers and businesses who currently sell such liquid to under 16s, seeking to cajole, persuade, encourage them to follow where others have already chosen to go. Because wouldn't it be great if we could reach our destination without the need for legislation? However, I do believe there's an accompanying role here for government in further raising awareness of the detrimental health impacts of under 16s consuming these drinks. Targeting the youthful consumers, their parents and those selling them who've not yet seen the light, as it were. And would, for example, the forthcoming obesity strategy offer a platform for doing that and perhaps providing guidance for retailers around the issue? The consumption of these drinks, presiding officer, crosses a number of health areas. Today in Scotland, 29% of children are obese or overweight, and almost a third of our primary school children have obvious dental decay. Restricting the sale of energy drinks that are not only high in caffeine, but in many cases also rammed full of sugar, to Scotland's young people can play a part in establishing a healthier diet for the future of our nation. Given the substantial public and media interest in this issue, uh, even if the cooperation of retailers means introducing a ban ultimately is judged unnecessary, I don't believe this is going away any time soon. And as I said, I think that away from any longer-term legislative solutions, there has to be a role for we as politicians in highlighting it and encouraging other retailers to self-restrain. We can also engage with our local authorities and their arm lengths Leather, uh, leisure organisations to ensure they aren't allowing access to these drinks. Some have, I, I know, have taken such action. There's no harm in double-checking the extent to which that's the case. And we may need still to encourage the supermarkets who've taken the right policy decision to ensure that's filtering through to the store level. Just yesterday, I was told of a supermarket in Edinburgh where the sale to under-16s may still be going on. That said, presiding officer, I am hopeful on this matter. Awareness and understanding is growing, and supermarkets and others have shown welcome responsibility on it. Our takeaway from tonight should be to spread the word and find ways of encouraging others to follow suit. Presiding officer. We move to the open debate. The speeches of up to four minutes, please. Uh, Brian Whittle to be followed by Marie Gujon. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank Graham Dave for securing time in the Parliament to debate this, which I think that uh, it is actually a hugely important topic that has ramifications across many other debates that we have in here. And I think this first came to light for me when, actually, funny enough, standing outside a polling station in Darville, where opposite the polling station, uh, the, the kids were all uh, catch the bus to go to, uh, go to school. And being the anorak that I am in, in this particular arena, I was noting uh, what the kids were eating on the way in uh, away to the, 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 uh, the, bus state, the bus stop, and I noticed a young, a young child with a can of uh, these, the, this energy drink, along with a huge big bag of uh, uh, sort of these fizzy type, uh, type sweets as well, and, 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 and eating and drinking and that on the way to, to uh, the, the bus stop. So I, I wondered what kind, of, what kind of state that child would be in when he sat down for his first class at, at nine o'clock, and I think then looking at what everybody else was eating in, in, in the queue. Not many of them were eating a fruit salad, let me tell you, uh, or, or, or something similar. So it is an issue I think we need to discuss. And there is a tension between uh, um, restricting, or, 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 or restricting what our children eat and allowing them the freedom to choose. And, that, and I think that's probably where the debate should be because I think all of us would agree that uh, uh, these kind of energy drinks are inherently bad, uh, especially at the younger age group. 
So I think one of the things that I, I wanted to highlight is, is, is the, the need for us to consider this in the round, to consider Scotland's relationship with, with, uh, with food and drink and physical activity and how we impact that. And I think that, the, the, as, as Graham Bay highlighted, there is an impact on health, both physically and mentally. And I wanted, especially after t today's debate, uh, uh, which was, was, um, was, was too short for me, I think, I wanted to highlight a, a quote that I was going to say from a Dr. David Kingdon, who's the Professor of Health Care Delivery at University of Southampton, when he says, can we prevent mental health problems? Uh, of course, the evidence is incontrovertible. So why don't we? The problems often start in childhood, but we spend most of our resources on dealing with the consequences in hospital uh, and in prisons. So I think when we're, when we're considering this, I think we should consider this in, in, our, in, in the general health uh, issue. And I think the other thing I wanted to quote was from the Mental Health Foundation presentation, Food for Thought, when they say one of the most obvious yet unrecognised factors in the development of mental health is nutrition. And there's a growing body of evidence indicating that nutrition may play an important part in the role of prevention, development and management of diagnosed mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, ADHD and dementia. So I think that, that there is a growing recognition here that there's, a, that there's, a, there's something to tackle, but I think in, it, in banning a product in and of itself is not the solution. So I think I would like to see this as part of a much wider strategy. Uh, and, and I think, I think uh, in this chamber in the two years, that, that, uh, the short two years I've been here, there is more and more focus coming onto this particular, uh, this particular topic. And there, and there are dots out there, I think, if we start to change, uh, I think could, be, it could really lead us to a different pathway, not just in banning these drinks. I think we're looking at a, at a obesity strategy that's coming out soon. We're all looking at a good food nation uh, strategy. We're looking at how we procure food as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of the elements, I think, that are there that can help us to deliver uh, a, a healthier Scotland. And as you know, presenting officer, I, I, could, I could talk about this stuff uh, forever and ever. In fact, it's all I've got to do. I think there's also, just to finish, I think we also need to be cognizant of our planning. Uh, uh, what's, what the environment around our schools. Uh, one of the things that we should be considering is what age do we allow our children to leave school uh, at, at dinner time? I've never, as I said, I've, I've never understood is teaching them health in school and then I'm allowed, opening the gates and allowing them to walk across the road and buy, have access to these things. So there's, there's lots of moving parts in this and I think, thank you for Graham Day for bringing this, this to the chamber. I think it is an element of, of a much wider strategy and, and, and I would support it. Presenting officer. Call Marie Goujon to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And again, I would echo what Brian Whittle said and start by thanking Graham Day for securing this debate today on such an important subject and an issue that we have to take a serious look at. And that's where I would really agree with what Brian Whittle said in his, uh, in his speech too, and that it's not just the case of looking at a ban as a solution in itself. It is all the wider things around that and the environment around our schools too. So I would completely agree uh, with those arguments. But this debate is also very timely for me and I decided to enter it because I was actually listening to an interview on Radio 2 last week with Jan Halper Hayes and her son Matthew died after consuming a considerable volume of energy drinks with alcohol aged only 19 and they're believed to have caused a blood clot in the arteries of his lungs which killed him instantly. So I know that that's not directly related to the motion today but it's because of that and because of the dangers that these drinks pose and the effect that they have particularly on our young people that I wholeheartedly support Graham Day's motion in welcoming the actions that have been taken so far by the National Federation of Retail news agents and major supermarkets and encourage all retailers to ban the sale of energy drinks to under 16s. Now, according to research from 2016, the UK has the second highest consumption of energy drinks per head in the world, and that's second only to Austria, which is the home of Red Bull. Now, sales of them in the UK increased by 155% between 2006 and 2014. A number of studies have been undertaken to assess the impact of energy drinks on young people. And one in particular by Hutton et al in 2013 looked at data from over 10,000 adolescents in Finland. Now that study found that daily consumption of energy drinks was strongly associated with four caffeine-induced health complaints, headaches, sleeping problems, irritation, and tiredness and fatigue. A similar study in Iceland with over 11,000 children, this time aged between 10 and 12, found that instances of headaches, stomach pains and sleeping problems generally increased where reported consumption of energy drinks increased. 
Now, these symptoms caused by energy drinks have been clear for those working in our schools to see, and for quite a some time now. Now, Forfar Academy in my constituency was the first school in Angus and one of the first across the country to ban energy drinks on its grounds. And this was instigated by former head teacher Melvin Lynch in 2016, who had written to the parents stating, it is our opinion that these drinks are a danger to the health of our young people and that they contain no nutritional benefits. In addition to these health risks, we are also extremely concerned about the effect these drinks are having on the behaviour of our young people. They can cause conflict with staff when pupils are advised that they should not be consuming these drinks in classes. We've also had occasions where pupils who have consumed energy drinks have been involved in more serious incidents that have led to exclusion. Whilst energy drinks are not solely to blame for this indiscipline, we believe that they are a contributory factor. Now, this view has since been shared and implemented more widely by all schools in Angus and across Scotland who don't allow these drinks on their grounds, as well as by small and large retailers alike. But while all of these issues are bad enough in and of themselves, there are a number of serious health risks associated with excessively high caffeine consumption. Palpitations, hypertension, nausea, vomiting, metabolic acidosis, convulsions, and in rare cases, even death. A study published in the Journal of the American Heart Association found in a controlled trial that energy drinks cause, can cause potentially harmful changes to heart function and to blood pressure. These are the dangers associated with the caffeine content of these drinks alone. And that's before we add the added impact of the high sugar levels, as well as the impact when these drinks are combined with physical activity or with alcohol, such as in the tragic case of Matthew Halter Hayes that I mentioned earlier. The effects of energy drink consumption simply can't be ignored. One of the UK's largest teaching unions described energy drinks as readily available legal highs. We saw the devastating impact legal highs had on people's lives. We acted on it and we have to do something here. And we need to act now to prevent the immediate impacts these drinks have on our young people and others who consume them regularly in excessive amounts, but also to prevent what could be a serious public health problem further down the line. And that's why I'm happy to support Graeme Day's motion. Thank you. <laughs> Call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And let me also start um, by joining others in thanking Graham Day for bringing this important issue to the chamber and indeed for the content of his speech as well. Because issues surrounding possible health risks for young people in Scotland aren't something to be taken lightly. And I very much am encouraged by the cross-party support that there is on this issue. In the last few years, the volume of energy drinks consumed in the UK has increased enormously. Now, I have a different set of statistics to Marie Goujon, but they tell the same story, you know. The British Nutrition Foundation um, tells us that consumption has increased from 463 million litres in 2010 to a staggering 672 million litres in 2016, and the figures are continuing to go the wrong way. The foundation also established that UK adolescents consume the highest amount of energy drinks out of 16 EU countries surveyed, with teenagers drinking something like 3.1 litres a month compared to the EU average of two litres. That's a staggering 50% more. Now, if Scottish young people were leading the way in the consumption of any other product which had such adverse effects on their health, there would be public outcry and robust legislative change. So what is it about energy drinks that we're so willing to ignore the hazards of? And let me, at the outset, praise the actions of retailers. You know, Graham Day listed many of them in my constituency, Waitrose, Morrisons, Asda, and Aldi. They've all taken it upon themselves to ban the sale of these drinks to under 16s. And whilst welcome though that is, it shouldn't necessarily be voluntary in nature. The EU food information regulation requires drinks that contain caffeine at a level over 150 milligrams per litre to state so on the label to say high caffeine content not recommended for children or breastfeeding women. Um, caffeine, we know, can have adverse effects on our mental health, on the behaviours of young people and indeed others. Um, Labelling is clear about the impact, but I think there is a case for going further, and I'd be interested in exploring that. Because the health risks of having too much caffeine for anyone at any age are widely known. We've had debates in this chamber before about caffeinated alcohol, creating wired, wider weight drunks, um, and the mix of caffeine and alcohol, frankly, is deadly. So why then do we allow a child 
to walk into some shops and purchase a can of Monster, which comes in at a whopping 338.1 milligrams per litre, or Red Bull with its 319.8 milligrams of caffeine per litre. This level of caffeine on a young and still developing body can have major neurological and cardiovascular side effects. Excessive caffeine consumption, which drinking just one energy drink would be classed as, can cause interrupted sleep, anxiety, behavioural changes. Now, speaking as both a parent and a politician, these are not traits that any of us want to see in our young people as they're growing, as they're learning, indeed as they're sitting exams, which will have a huge impact on their future. So it's vital that drinks that have had caffeine added to them for effectively a physiological side effect um, are regulated, and both in terms of who can buy them and how much caffeine is allowed. Now, there may be ways around regulation, but, but I think we need to turn our attention to this. And, you know, I think Mary Goujon was the one who pointed out the same worries exist for the quantities of sugar found in these drinks. The combination of sugar, caffeine, artificial additives create a cocktail of both short and long-term health risks. Food Nutrition Foundation found that if a 16-year-old were to consume just one can of an energy drink in a day, they would have already have exceeded the daily recommended sugar intake for that day. Let me illustrate this. Um, one can of the energy drink, Rockstar, has 20 teaspoons of sugar in it, just one can. We already have an epidemic of childhood obesity in the country, and that will continue to rise. You know, it's the equivalent of three bars of chocolate sitting and eating three bars of chocolate in one go, and we are complicit in the consumption of energy drinks. Um, in coming to a conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome the voluntary action by the supermarkets and others, but I think government has a role in education and awareness raising, in labeling, in age restrictions, in changing the recipe indeed, and limiting the amount of caffeine that's there. So in conclusion, let me thank Graham Day again for raising, I know two conclusions, presiding officer, um, for raising awareness of this important issue in the chamber. Thank you. Call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I join other members in thanking Graham Day for bringing forward this topic for debate? Um, I think this has become a bit of a touchstone issue. Uh, many people have written to me about it. And I think in many ways, you know, the issue of energy uh, drinks is a bit of an indicator about the health of our wider food culture as well. And it also brings into sharp focus the responsibilities of food companies, responsibilities of public institutions and retailers as well, and the kind of action that we need to take on the back of that. I um, can also join members in congratulating the Courier on their Can It campaign um, to get energy drinks banned from schools. And I was delighted to back the campaign when it launched back in 2016. And since then, schools across Courier Country, from Blair Gary High to Wade Academy, have been backing the ban. And the campaign has brought a much needed debate about the health impacts of these drinks in classrooms, but it's also opened up a welcome talking point around diet within many families, including my own. And it's clear that energy drinks are not recommended for children. In fact, as we've heard already, every can states that exactly on its side. And no wonder, because regular consumption of high-calorie, high-caffeine energy drinks have been linked to anxiety, behavioral disorder, disorders, nausea, tooth decay, obesity, and even breathing difficulties. And it must be a nightmare to teach a class fueled on energy drinks, and it can't be a good environment to learn in either. So I'm pleased the drive for a ban in schools has been coming not just from the teachers, but also from the pupils as well. Now, the origin of these drinks comes from their use in extreme sports, long-distance driving, tiring working environments where they've been designed as an artificial fix for flagging concentrations and fatigue. They obviously shouldn't be the daily breakfast on the way to school, and yet we can all see the empty cans and bottles littering our communities. There was a time, presiding officer, when a bowl of ready brek was the breakfast with magical energy-boosting properties, but it seems, it seems no more. And of course, food and drink is a complex issue for young people. It's not just about taste, it's about the social aspect of school lunch times, as well as the social aspect of the start and the end of the day. And I was amazed when visiting a high school recently how the rush to get served quick and get a seat with your mates at lunchtime was the biggest factor in whether to join the fast food queue or not. It wasn't actually about the food, uh, it was more about the social aspect of eating and the choices that young people make. So we need to listen to the experiences that young people have, understand that food and drink is sociable and fun, 
and also offer menus and eating experiences throughout the day that provide a healthy but exciting set of choices on a budget. And it's perfectly possible to achieve this. There are many schools across Scotland that are getting the food culture right, that are getting uh, the sense of choice right. And of course, programmes such as Food for Life, which is now being extended across Scotland to all 32 local authorities, are doing great work uh, in helping local authorities and school menus develop and evolve over time. Um, now, I welcome that, um, as many members have reflected on, that major retailers have now banned the sale of these high-caffeine, high-calorie drinks to young people under the age of 16. That's clearly the right thing to do. With convenience stores, there's perhaps slower progress, with just over half voluntarily banning sales to under-16s. And, of course, it only takes one local store near a school which is prepared to retail energy drinks for that uh, um, supplier then to become... Uh, the, the main shop that local uh, people, local children will go to to buy energy drinks and indeed other um, foodstuffs as well that are perhaps unhealthy. So the Association of Convenience Stores believe that such a ban would be challenging to enforce, but they also acknowledge that the sector is already effective at enforcing age restrictions on a wide range of products from tobacco to alcohol, fireworks and solvents. I think the jury's out on whether a voluntary approach will be effective going forward, but if it isn't, and it doesn't prove its worth, then a legal ban should be on the cards to get energy drinks out of our school bags for good. Call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And like others, I'd like to sincerely thank my friend uh, Graham Day and my colleague Graham Day for bringing this debate to the Chamber. This is an important issue, and I'd like to see that it gathered support from MSPs of most parties represented in this Parliament. I remember vividly a by-election in Aberdeen a number of years ago, a parliamentary by-election. A few of us, indeed a number of us, fueled ourselves on copious amounts of one particular energy drink. I won't be discourteous and mention the name of that particular drink. Nevertheless, despite the branding, nobody in the campaign team appeared to notice the wings that I had sprouted. Once the campaign team day was over, myself and others had fueled ourselves thoroughly with this stuff to get us through some very, very long days. But what happened? We experienced headaches and lightheadedness, and that was a group of us. It was that moment I truly became very aware of the damaging impact this stuff was having on my person. Goodness knows what it was doing to others. So it's long been my view that high caffeinated food and drink products should not be consumed by children and young people. It's clear to me, and I know to many others, members that the artificial increase in a person's pulse rate through chemical induction, because that's what it is, cannot be good for anyone, never mind a person sta still in their stages of development. Now, Graham Day spoke of the experiences that teachers in his constituency have had in regard to disruptive pupils who were sold energy drinks down the street at lunchtime. I confirm to him that's not just a problem in South Angus or Angus South, to be more precise. Teachers in my own constituency in Stirling know all too well of the detrimental effect of energy drinks on the behaviour of children and young people. So, you know, sir, what a potentially devastating prospect this is. The education experiences of children and young people are being impact impacted on by potentially dangerously high levels of caffeine and even taurine buzzing about in their systems. And as we've heard before, a report from the British Medical Journal has also previously mentioned in the debate, citing links between the consumption of energy drinks with higher rates of headaches, stomach aches, hyperactivity and insomnia. The physical damage that can be done through perpetual headaches and stomach aches al alongside altering the pace of a person's heart is bad enough. However, it's now clear that induced hyperactivity and insomnia can pose a real risk to a person's mental health as a result of consumption of this stuff. The young people who are still developing through their teenage years in particular are vulnerable. Indeed, research at the World Health Organization agree there's a proven negative effect of caffeine on children. And the same researchers mentioned quite rightly and, and highlighted by Graham Day's members motion, the it recommended the sale of energy drinks to children and adolescents ought to be restricted. So, President Officer, how do we tackle this problem? All retailers, from supermarkets to corner shops, should take the lead. And I'm delighted that some shops in my old constituency have already done so. But I passed a, 
a self-service checkout in a local supermarket just last week. And there was a rather irritated gentleman who was just waiting to purchase the additional his, his uh, energy drinks. It took a few additional seconds for him, obviously, to do so because the checks had to be carried out. Now, I can understand he was irritated. Some uh, consumers will oppose these moves. They want their shopping experience to be as smooth as possible. That's understandable. But it's, this inconvenience pales into insignificance when we consider the potential impact that energy drinks are having on the health and education of our children and young people. This is a necessary measure, and I encourage more retailers in my constituency to take a lead on this. So, you know, that's a start, but for the good of our children and our young people, let's do more. And that might include in the long term the need for legislation, albeit reluctantly, if supermarkets and stores cannot deliver through voluntary action. And in closing, can I once again thank Graham Day for bringing this important matter to the Chamber for debate this evening. Thank you. Uh, Alison Harris has the last of the open debate contributions. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also thank Graeme Day for bringing this hugely important debate to the Chamber this evening. There is absolutely no doubt that energy drinks are a billion-dollar industry and their popularity keeps growing despite health concerns. We've heard tonight across the Chamber the effects of these energy drinks and the dangers that they pose, particularly for children and teens. In fact, I think we've probably heard everything I'm about to say tonight across the Chamber, but I'm going to proceed in any case. <laughs> energy drinks typically contain large amounts of caffeine, added sugars, other additives and legal stimulants. And it's these legal stimulants that can increase alertness, attention and energy, as well as increasing blood pressure, heart rate and breathing. These drinks are often used by students to provide that extra boost in energy. However, the stimulants in these drinks can have a harmful effect on the nervous system. The potential dangers of energy drinks include dehydration, heart, complica heart complications such as irregular heartbeat and heart failure, anxiety and insomnia. Studies have shown that children who consume moderate amounts of caffeine before physical activity can have elevated blood pressure, while in extreme cases involving adults, excessive consumption has led to death. Children and teenagers are being deceived into drinking large cans of energy drinks, thinking they're going to improve their performance at school or during a sports event, but in reality, it's more likely increasing their risk of developing obesity, type 2 diabetes and dental cavities, which will have lifelong implications on their health. I found it very disturbing that the results of a recent study revealed that energy drink consumers are unaware of the product's main ingredients, health implications or appropriate serving sizes. It is children and teenagers who are our main consumers of energy drinks and it's these same children who are being subjected to these unacceptably high levels of sugar and caffeine. The average sugar content of an energy drink is more than the entire recommended daily maximum for a, an adult in the UK. That is damning in itself, but what about the children who drink several of these drinks throughout the course of a day? Energy drinks are marketed for general consumption rather than for athletes who are targeted with so-called sports drinks. Despite energy drinks with high caffeine levels having to carry a warning that they are not recommended for children or pregnant women, a study recently found that 43 products carrying such warnings contained the caffeine equivalent of nearly two cups of coffee and a survey involving, as we've heard, 16 European countries, including the UK, found that 68% of 11 to 18 year olds and 18% of children aged 10 and under consume energy drinks with 11% of the older group and 12% of children overall drinking at least one litre at a time. I mean, it's utter madness. Teachers and health professionals have expressed concerns about youngsters relying on the drinks, even to start the day as a substitute for breakfast or in a packed lunch. And a survey carried out by the Make Mine Milk campaign revealed that one in 20 teenage pupil regularly goes to school on a can of an energy drink instead of tucking into a good breakfast. Chef Jamie Oliver has campaigned for quite some time now to see higher standards of meals as well as scrutinising packed lunches. And he has repeatedly criticised high energy drinks and famously said on the subject, and I quote, I challenge you to go, to go to any school and open 50 lunch boxes and I guarantee you there will be one or two cans of Red Bull. He has repeatedly voiced serious concern that these drinks are turning our kids into addicts. 
referencing teachers having to plan lessons around high students. I think Jamie summed the selling of these energy drinks to children very effectively when he claimed that children are relying on energy drinks to give them the boost they need to get up in the morning, then they experience a low when the effects of the sugar and caffeine wear off, so have another in the afternoon before finishing off the day with a final can. This yo-yo of highs and lows makes, teenage, makes youngsters feel lethargic the next morning, prompting them to reach for another energy drink and the cycle begins again. I find the facts around the content of energy drinks and the ease at which young people can access them very alarming. And I congratulate all the major supermarkets who have been instrumental in supporting the banning of the sales of energy drinks to under 16s. And again, a huge thanks to those independent retailers in Scotland who have supported the ban. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I once again acknowledge and thank everyone within the retail sector who have pledged to implement this ban. Thank you. Thank you, and I ask Aileen Campbell to uh, wind up the debate, please, for around seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, like others this evening, I also congratulate Graham Day on bringing this issue before us uh, in the Parliament. Uh, and Mr Day has long campaigned uh, on this subject for many years, both in Angus and nationally, and it's in part thanks to him that we're now seeing a welcome shift in the approach of retailers to the sale of these drinks. He has truly, I think, rolled up his sleeves and got on with helping to, to kickstart a shift to encourage responsible retailing and improving our nation's health. So I again uh, underline my thanks to Graeme Day for bringing this motion to give us all a chance and opportunity to talk about our concerns and where possible solutions lie. And many others, of course, across this chamber have also been involved in showing real uh, leadership and I've thoroughly uh, uh, appreciated the, the constructive tone of this debate and the, the, the views and the thoughts and the ideas that members have shared uh, with us. Uh, Brian also, Whittle also noted that he, what he saw a polling station and similarly it was in a political theme in which we heard from uh, Bruce Crawford who suggested he grew some wings uh, to go and continue with his canvassing and maybe that might explain why he's so fleet at getting up those closes when we're out uh, canvassing uh, but hopefully he just sticks to good old fashioned soup and a cup of coffee or a cup of tea at the next by-election that we, wherever that may be. But of course, this is a topic that is of significant concern to our society, especially to parents, teachers and young people. And as I'm a parent as well, eh, my wee boy has yet to hit those years where he is more susceptible to purchasing those energy drinks. But so while we want to do and must do all we can for children and young pe people in the here and now, the culture change that I think we all want eh, has also a, a large preventative element to it to ensure that younger children grow up in an environment that is conducive eh, to good health. So the benefits are long term eh, and generational. The health and well-being of our young people, though, is a responsibility that we all share and it transcends eh, party politics. Again, why I think tonight's debate has been so constructive. And that's why improving the Scottish diet is so important. Our forthcoming diet and our healthy weight eh, delivery plan reflects the priority that we attach to this. And as eh, members will know, eh, the Deputy First Minister's launch of the consultation on school food last week means that it's also a much more generally a top priority for government. It, this issue cuts across portfolios and reflects an attempt to encourage good health and wellbeing, requiring us to use all the levers that we have right across uh, government. Our proposed amendments to the school food and drink regulations will move them closer to the Scottish dietary uh, goals and they will see a tightening of the already stringent standards by restricting sugar-free drinks containing more than 150 milligrams of caffeine per litre in secondary schools. And we also propose that primary schools should only be allowed to serve water and plain milk or milk alternatives. Current regulations do not allow any energy drinks to be made available at any time in the school. And schools are encouraged to consider their health promotion duties when setting their own policies about what products they allow their pupils to bring into the school. So I welcome the moves taken by schools like St Ninian's and Kirkintilloch, Blairgowrie High School in Perthshire, who have also taken uh, proactive steps to restrict energy drinks. And also from hearing uh, from Mary Goujon about measures taken by Forfar Academy. Uh, we should support those schools and share that good practice uh, and uh, celebrate the priority that these schools are placing on good health. But I also uh, really uh, uh, like the contribution from Mark Ruskell about the culture of eating food in a school, uh, trying to encourage the enjoyment around uh, school, maybe slowing the pace of when children and young people are having their school dinners. And I think that's important that we more generally change that culture of the enjoyment of food uh, uh, within our school settings. 
But of course, while the European Food Safety Authority has confirmed that energy drinks are safe to consume, everyone, including the British Soft Drinks Association, acknowledges that they should not be marketed to those under the age of 16. Aside from their caffeine content, many energy drinks contain extremely high levels of added sugar. And I think Marie Goujon, Jackie Bailey and others eh, mentioned that in their contributions. One 500 milliliter bottle could contain around double the daily recommended maximum for an adult. And many contributions this evening have linked energy drinks more generally to those wider health concerns. Because in Scotland, as others have pointed out, 29% of children are at risk of becoming overweight, including 14% at risk of obesity. Evidence also shows that obese children are likely to stay obese into adulthood and become more likely to suffer health problems such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases at a, a later age. And that is why we have a, set a guiding ambition to have child obesity in Scotland by 2030. And we'll outline the new diet and healthy weight delivery plan uh, and the necessary actions to achieve this and help everybody make healthier choices about food and drink. But we'll also be cognizant of the call to weave in con the contributions that we've heard this evening regarding energy drinks and making sure, as I think Brian Whittle and others said, to use every platform that we have to ensure that there is a consistency across all that we do. But of course, it's not just the health of our children that should be a concern of, to us, but also their ability to learn and I know that teachers in particular have expressed concern through their trade unions about the potential impact on attainment. Again, Graham Day articulated that from the discussions that he's had with his local school and about the impact on not just their ability to learn but their behaviours more generally and I think so too did uh, Bruce Crawford. A 2016 study looked at over 2,000 children and found that energy drink consumption was consistently associated with low school performance so we are right to be concerned and again shows and highlights that we need to make sure that we are consistently applying and using the platforms we have across government eh, to make the impact that we all agree needs to be eh, delivered. And I'm confident though that schools up and down the country are taking eh, appropriate steps to tackle this issue but of course this is only one part of the solution. Retailers around those schools must act responsibly which is why I welcome the recent statement by the National Federation of Retail News Agents and we will also be working and continue to work with the Scottish Grocer Federation around help we can provide to convenience stores on how to restrict energy drink sales. Again, I think issues that were both raised by Graham Day and Mark Ruskell. Other retailers, are, retailers have also taken voluntary action to ban the sale of energy drinks to those under the age of 16. And we sincerely thank all who have done so and urge any that haven't yet made that commitment to do so as soon as possible. And as members know, reshaping the food environment is a key uh, programme for government commitment and research commissioned by the government which explores the relationship between the food environment and the planning system is drawing to a close. And this research considers how the planning system can best support the creation of an improved food environment in Scotland, including the area around schools, and identifies effective and less effective approaches taken elsewhere. Again, as I've said uh, many times this evening, using all the levers across, Scotland, uh, across the government to positively influence good health in our communities. But society is not just about school or the school environment, and we need to look beyond school. So I just want to very briefly mention, presiding officer, that my officials have started discussion with SPORTA, the coordinating body for leisure trusts, on whether measures can be taken by their members to place age restrictions on the sale of energy drinks to under 16s. And that action has already seen uh, uh, Edinburgh Leisure and West Lothian Leisure uh, taking action. I commend them for doing so. Sporters members manage around 1,300 facilities in Scotland, everything from gyms to museums and some with a considerable number of visitors by young people. So that is an important development that will continue to uh, take forward and push, uh, put, apply pressure to. Uh, so again, uh, well, I thank uh, Graeme Day for the opportunity to debate this important issue and the chance to demonstrate from the government's perspective our ongoing commitment to support young people in making healthier choices and what better year to do that than in the year of, of young people. Scotland's best when uh, we work together and whether that's with our health boards, with our schools, with our uh, local authorities or whether it's with the retailers and manufacturers, if we collectively work we can get the action that we need and I think that's why it is uh, really uh, good the work that Graeme Day has been doing to apply the pressure and to encourage the voluntary action. We can of course look at what else we need to do in the future but the success we're having and seeing it the here and now is something that we can build upon to create the healthier Scotland that I think across the chamber we all agree we need to uh, achieve. So thank you. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.